Hey, what's up coders? Hope you are doing well. Today we are creating this image comparison slider inspired by an image comparison slider I came across while optimizing some images for the web using the compressor.io website. In this case, it is used in order to compare the original image before compression and after. We will try to recreate this, replicating the functionality and styling. Except for the bottom part here with the before and after image size, so that our image comparison slider will be a bit more general. It could be used for example to compare an image before and after editing. Here we are comparing two pictures of myself in two different time periods. This is me before learning to code and after. I hope you will enjoy this video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and without further ado, let's go. This is our starting point. In the projects folder, we have three empty files, the index.html, style.css and main.js and a folder called images containing the two images we want to compare. I named these images 1 and 2. I guess before and after would also make sense. I'm using two completely different images so that they are easily distinguishable. And also notice that the human figure in the second image is exactly at the center horizontally which could come in handy as a visual point of reference while implementing the feature. Now in our index.html file I type exclamation mark says emmet abbreviation VS code which is the code editor I'm currently using comes with the emmet plugin embedded and if I hit tab or enter we get some HTML5 boilerplate code to begin with. Let's insert the title image comparison slider and sooner or later we'll need to link the external files to the document. So let's do it now. First the style.css file using the link tag and in the body right above the closing body tag the main.js file using the script tag. We are all set now. Let's add the markup for the image comparison slider. The body will be the main container. We won't add some other container element in order to keep the markup to a minimum. So our image comparison slider will be a div with ID image comparison slider. I can do this due to Emmet by the way. The image comparison slider will contain of course the two images we want to compare. The first image, let's set the alt attribute to before. And instead of simply adding the second image here, we will rather include it within a div with the class image wrapper. This is in order to be able to change the width of the image wrapper according to the mouse or touch position, keeping the image dimensions unchanged so that image won't get distorted. And combined with the overflow property set to hidden for the image wrapper, we will get the desired effect. I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. I'm just trying to give you a rough overview on how we'll go about it later. Next, let's add the before and after labels by using span elements with the class label. And we need two of those. Text for the first one will be before and for the second one after. But besides the shared styling, the two labels will differentiate in positioning and background color. So let's also add distinct classes to each label in order to simplify their selection with CSS. The label before class for the before span and label after for the after span. 
What remains now regarding the HTML markup is to add the slider handle which consists of two lines and a circle containing these two arrows pointing to the left and right. So everything will be contained within a div with a class handle, the two vertical lines the top and bottom which will be div elements with a class handle line and in between the circle which will be a div with a class handle circle. The circle in turn will contain the two arrows. Now we could use HTML entities for the arrows or even create them from scratch with CSS or use images but instead we'll use font awesome icons which we'll include into our project via a CDN. So let's visit the cdnjs.com website and search for font awesome. Here we are. Let's copy this URL for the minified CSS file and link it to our document. Font awesome icons are now available and what remains is to add the left and the right arrow icons within the handle circle. In the font awesome website, let's search for arrow icons. This is the left arrow, not exactly what we want. Chevron and angle icons look quite similar, let's go with chevron. This is the HTML for the left one, let's copy it. Nice, and similarly we add the right chevron icon. And that's all with the HTML markup. Before proceeding to CSS, let's open the project in the browser. For this purpose I'm using the live server, which is a Visual Studio Code extension that allows for live reloading. So this is what we've created up to this point, the first or before image, the second or after image, the before and after labels, and the left and right font awesome arrow icons from the handle, and more specifically the handle circle. Ok, let's proceed to styling with CSS. I usually start by resetting margin and padding to zero and box sizing to border box for all elements. Body in our example will be the main container and in order to center its content which in this case is just the image comparison slider, we set its width to 100% and minimum height to 100% of the viewport height and use flexbox in order to vertically and horizontally center the content. Currently the images are huge so we can't clearly see the centering yet. We'll set dimensions for the slider and images in a bit but finishing with the body Let's also set font family to Helvetica which is considered to be a web safe font with sans serif as the fallback font. Next for the image comparison slider. Let's set its width to 80% of viewport width. And let's also set overflow to hidden. Now if we also set the height here, for example let's set it to 80% of viewport height, then we also lose the flexibility of maintaining the image aspect ratio regarding the dimensions of the slider. So instead let's allow the image to determine the height. For this purpose let's target the image comparison slider images. This styling applies to both images by the way. And let's set display to block. Images in general are a bit peculiar regarding the way they are displayed. 
I think default display value is inline, but they actually behave as if it were inline block. In any case, if you are unsure, specifying the display property value for images is not a bad idea. Next, let's set width to 100% of the container elements width. Nice. Of course, as soon as we change width for image wrapper, which is a container element for the second image, this won't work as intended for the second image. So instead of percentage, we'll eventually specify the length. But let's keep the percentage for now. Height is by default set to auto, but let's specify it anyway just to make things clearer. So, given the slider's width, the height will be adjusted according to the image's aspect ratio. And more specifically, the first image will determine the height, since the second image, as well as everything else to be exact, will eventually be absolutely positioned relative to the slider. Okay, and before proceeding, in order to simplify styling, Let's temporarily comment out in HTML the various components of the slider except currently for the first image and we will gradually add them back in, styling each part separately. So back to styling for the slider, let's round the corners a bit by setting border radius to 2.5 rem Nice, and the reason this works without also having to set border radius for the image is because we've set overflow to hidden for the slider. And maybe 2.5 is a bit intense. So let's set border radius to 0.5 REM instead. Next, let's add box shadow using the same property values as the slider we are trying to recreate. Horizontal offset is set to minus 7 pixels, putting the shadow on the left side. Vertical offset 5 pixels, pushing the shadow to the bottom side. Blur radius 16 pixels, spread radius 1 pixel and shadow color to this bluish color with opacity set to 0.6. Let's save. And the shadow we get. Also notice that the mouse cursor changes when mouse is over the slider. So let's set cursor to call resize. Okay, and one last thing regarding the slider element styling. We've set its width to 80% of viewport width and resizing the window. This is how the slider's dimensions are changing. As you can see, it can't get quite large. So in order to have better control, let's also set a maximum width for the slider. to let's say 768 pixels. I'm just using this number because it is a common breakpoint, but apart from that, it is quite arbitrary. Now, by resizing the window, we can see that the slider stops growing as soon as it reaches its maximum width. Alternatively, we could set the width using the min CSS function, setting width to be the minimum value between 80% of viewport width and 768 pixels. Again, this way, the slider's width cannot exceed the 768 pixels threshold. And by resizing the window, again, we get the same result. Let's keep this approach. Browser support, by the way, for the min CSS function, 
currently already covers more than 90% of global usage. Ok, let's proceed and complete styling for the slider images. We've set height to auto but again let's make sure that height won't exceed a certain level by setting max height to let's say 80% of viewport height. Before saving let me decrease the browser window height to see what currently happens. Ok, let's save to activate the max height. Nice and in order to preserve the image aspect ratio Let's set object fit to cover. Finally, we'll set pointer events to none in order to ensure that images will not react to pointer events since they will never be the target of pointer events and user select to none making the images unselectable. So before saving I can select the image, after saving I cannot. Next in our HTML file let's uncomment the image wrapper which contains the second or after image and proceed to styling. The image wrapper will be absolutely positioned relative to the slider. Starting from the top right corner. And extending to the entire height of the slider. And for now let's set its width to 50% of the slider's width. And uh, since we've set width for the images to 100% of their containing blocks width, we also get 50% for the wrapper images width. However, we want both images to expand to the entire width of the slider. So instead of using a percentage here, let's specify the length using of course the same value we've used for the slider. Ok, we are getting there, the wrapper's image will eventually be absolutely positioned, currently by default it is statically positioned within its wrapper. For example, in order to check the current behavior, Let's change the wrapper's width to 90%, 70, 20 and back to 50. Now before proceeding notice that we are using the same value for the width in two different places so we could use a CSS variable or custom property for this. This is totally unnecessary by the way, it is just a personal preference. So for the root element, which actually represents the HTML element, we declare the image comparison slider width variable and set its value. And we then replace the corresponding width values with the variable value using the var function. And again we end up with the same result. But now if we want to change the value for the slider width, this is the only place we have to do it. For example, let's reduce the maximum slider width to 268 pixels and here's the result. Browser support by the way for CSS variables is currently around 95%. Let's proceed to styling the image within the wrapper. As already mentioned, it will be absolutely positioned relative to its nearest positioned ancestor, which in this case is the wrapper. However, we'll use the same positioning 
So I guess we could say that indirectly it is positioned relative to this slider. The width and height for slider images is already defined here. However, instead of setting height to auto for the wrapper image, we will set it to 100%. This is in order to ensure that it will always cover the entire height, even in case of images with different aspect ratio. What remains is to hide the overflowing part of the wrapper image by setting overflow to hidden for the wrapper. Nice, and again let's change the wrapper's width to see what happens now to 100%, 70, 30, 0, and back to 50. Excellent. And let's also set Z index to 1 for the wrapper in order to ensure, well, in this case, actually just to show that it will always be on top of the first image. Although in this case it is not really necessary since the wrapper with position set to absolute will anyway be on top of the first image with the default static positioning. Ok, let's proceed by uncommenting the before and after labels in our HTML. Here they are. And in order to accelerate a bit, I will paste the corresponding styling and quickly go through. I will of course include a link to this project in the description. Starting with the positioning for the label elements, we set position to absolute, again of course relative to the slider, and top position to 1rem from the top edge of the slider. And if we save, we can't see the labels yet due to the dark background, so let's also set color to white. Ok, and now let's position the before label to the left, setting left to 1rem from the left edge of the slider and the after label to the right. We can see the left label for the before image but not the right one for the after image. And that's because we've set Z index to 1 for the image wrapper, so it is on top of the label. In order to ensure that the labels will be on top, we should set Z index to a greater stack order, so it should be greater than 1. Setting Z index to 2 would work. However, we'll set it to 3 so that labels will also be on top of the handle which will have its Z index set to 2. Let me show you what I mean in the original slider. As you can see, the handle always lies below the labels. Next, we add some more basic styling to the labels, background color, border radius, padding, font size, text align, letter spacing and user select is set to none. Ok, we can't clearly see the background color which is set to black with opacity set to 0.33 due to the dark background of the images we are using. If, for example, we set it to yellow, then it becomes more obvious. Ok, let's reset. And for the after label, we'll use this reddish background color. There is no transparency for this one, by the way. Finally, we only want the labels to be visible while hovering over the slider. For this purpose, we initially set opacity to 0 for the labels and using the hover selector over the slider, we set opacity to 1 for the labels when the mouse is over the slider. And instead of an instant transition for the label's opacity, 
we set transition duration to 0.25 seconds and transition timing function to this cubic bezier function which I actually just copied from the original slider let me show you so if we inspect the label styling here are the label transition settings and if we save we now get the transition for the labels. Moving on, let's add the last piece of the puzzle, the handle, by uncommenting the corresponding HTML markup. Recall that the handle consists of three parts, the two handle lines and the handle circle which in turn contains the two fondosome icons, the left and right chevron. And following the same strategy, I will paste the styling and go through. For starters, let's add a red border to the handle just in order to help us while styling, we will eventually remove it. The handle is a div and therefore a block level element so it currently takes up the entire width of its container or parent element which in this case is the slider although we can't clearly see it here because the image wrapper is on top. But in any case the handle will be absolutely positioned again relative to the slider starting from the top edge of the slider so top position is set to 0 and for now we also set left to 0 although we will later reposition the handle horizontally changing the left property value so that the handle will initially be positioned to the center. Of course we could alternatively work with the right property instead of the left. Next, we set width for the handle to 50 pixels and height to 100%. OK. And for now, let's just set the color for the handle circle content to white so that we can at least see the icons. Continuing with the handle, again, we are using Flexbox in order to center its content, but this time setting flex direction to column instead of the default which is row so that its content the flexible items will be displayed vertically and again we make the handle and its content unselectable by setting user select to none and this time z index is set to 2 for the handle so that it will be on top of the image wrapper which has its Z index set to 1 and below the labels with Z index set to 3. Next, before styling the handle lines, let's complete styling for the handle circle. We set its width to 50 pixels which is the same as the handle width Again, we are using the same value more than once, so I guess we could use a CSS variable for this, and we probably will, but for now let's move on. And we also set its height to 50 pixels since we want to end up with a circle. Border is set to 2 pixels width, solid and white, and border radius to 50% so that square is turned into a circle. And what remains is to properly position the content of the handle circle, the two icons. We'll do this again using Flexbox, so display property is set to flex. Align items to center in order to vertically center the content. And justify content to space evenly in order to horizontally align the content. If, for example, instead of space evenly, we set it to center, this is what we'd get. If we set it to space between, we would get this, space around, 
this which looks ok but let's go with space evenly. And that's all for the handle circle styling, the background color for the circle will be transparent so we don't have to specify it since it is the default value and let's proceed to styling the handle lines. We set the line width to 2 pixels, flex grow to 1, this is in order to force the handle lines to take up all free space on the main axis which in this case is the vertical axis, since we've set flex direction to column for the handle, which is the flex container for the handle lines and circle. And finally we set background color for handle lines to white. Very nice. An alternative approach would be to set the height for handle lines, to at least 50% in order to ensure that they will cover the entire space and in order to prevent this shrinking of the circle from happening, we can set the flex shrink property value for the circle to 0 instead of the default which is 1 and if we save, again we get the intended result. Ok, but let's go with flex grow. And what remains now is to position the handle to the center of the slider which will be its initial position. By changing the left value for the handle, let's try 50%, that's 50% from the left edge of the slider. Ok, we are almost there but in order to exactly center it, we now have to move it to the right, in this case by 25 pixels which is half of the handle's width. We can do this by subtracting 25 pixels from the 50% value. This of course currently doesn't work. In order to perform calculations with CSS, we can use the CSS calc function. Browser support by the way for the calc function is currently already close to 98% so I think at this point we shouldn't worry about that and if we save, we now get the intended positioning for the handle. Ok, and one improvement we could make in our code would be to use a CSS variable for the slider handle width instead of hard coding it to multiple places and we could also use it in the calculation here. So in the root element, we declare the image comparison slider handle width variable setting its value to 50 pixels and we then replace the corresponding values with the variable value again using the var function and for the calculation we replace the hardcoded 25 pixels with the handle width variable value divided by 2. And if we save, again we end up with the same result but this time using the variable value. So if for example we decided to set the handle width to let's say 80 pixels instead of 50, all we have to do is to change the variable value here and we are all set. Ok, I think we are done with the CSS styling and we don't need the handle border anymore, let's remove it. Let's also check how it looks on smaller screens, F12. I think it already looks decent. Maybe we could increase the width for the slider a bit more. Currently it takes up 80% of viewport width 
since width for the current screen is only 360 pixels, so for smaller screens let's change this to 90% of viewport width. I will paste this part and what this means is that for screens with 768 pixels width or less, these styling rules apply. In our case, we are only resetting the image comparison slider width variable value to 90% of viewport width. And if we save, this is the result. We gain some more space for the slider. Now I'm getting close to the 768 pixels breakpoint. Let's see what happens. As expected, at that point, the slider's width jumps from 80% of viewport width to 90%. Okay, and now let's bring our image comparison slider to live with JavaScript. The goal is to listen for a mouse move event over the slider and according to the mouse position to reset the image wrapper width and the handle position and more specifically the left position for the handle. For example, if the mouse moves here, let's say 25% from the left edge of the slider, then the image wrapper width should be set to 75% since we are counting from the right edge, so it is 1 minus 25%. And for the left position of the handle, Here in the calculation we should use 25%. And we get the new state for the slider according to the hypothetical mouse position. Ok, let's undo the changes so that initial position will be the center and move on to our JavaScript file to implement what I've just tried to describe. For starters, let's get the image comparison slider element and store it into a variable for easier access. We'll do this using the query selector method. And I'm simply naming the variable slider, actually meaning image comparison slider, in order to keep things shorter. And similarly, we get the image wrapper and handle elements and store them into the corresponding variables. I will paste this part. So this is the slider image wrapper element. And I'm probably being a bit over specific with the selector. Simply using the class selector would be sufficient in this case. And this is the slider handle. Next step is to add an event listener over the slider for the mouse move event and whenever this event occurs or in other words whenever the mouse moves over the slider, the slider mouse move function will be executed. Let's implement this function right now. We first need to get the mouse position and more specifically the horizontal or X position relative to the slider. For this purpose, let's first get the X coordinate of the left edge. Well, to be exact, the X coordinate of the upper left corner of the slider and store it into a variable. Let's name the variable slider left X and use the offset left property over the slider in order to get the left position in pixels. There are of course as usual different ways to approach the problem. For example, we could alternatively go with the get bounding client rect method over the slider in order to get the left position 
as well as the width of the slider because we will also need that always of course taking into account the differences between each approach okay let's also get the width of the slider we can do this using the client width property over the slider which returns the width in pixels only including padding but not the border scroll bar or margin there is also the offset width property which besides padding also includes the border and scroll bar and we store this into the slider width variable next step is to get the mouse x position relative to the slider's left edge we can use the client x property over the mouse move event in order to get the x coordinate of the mouse pointer this is relative to the viewport and subtract the slider's left edge x coordinate in order to get the position relative to the slider in other words mouse x is the horizontal distance between the mouse pointer and the left edge of the slider in pixels of course and the slider width will help us calculate this distance as a percentage but before proceeding let's lock mouse x in the console the current width of this slider is 768 pixels which is the maximum width let's move to the console and start hovering from left to right the lowest value is 0 at the left edge and the mouse x value increases while moving further to the right around the center it gets to 383 or 84 pixels and it reaches maximum at the right edge 767 pixels okay and although we don't expect the mouse x value to move beyond the zero and slider width range since we've also set overflow to hidden for the slider i would feel more comfortable explicitly defining the mouse x boundaries and let's change const to let for mouse x since now there is the possibility of reassignment so we are setting the mouse x value here and if it is less than zero then it is set to zero else if it gets greater than the slider width then it is set to slider width what remains now is to change the slider image wrapper width and the slider handle left position according to the current mouse position starting with the slider image wrapper we set its width two and let's use template literals so these are backticks and not single quotes now we could set the width in pixels or as a percentage of the slider's width let's first go with pixels although eventually we'll end up using percentages and I will try to make an argument in favor of the percentage approach via this example. So mouse X is the horizontal distance of the mouse pointer from the left edge of the slider and therefore the image wrapper width which starts from the right edge of the slider will be slider width minus mouse X and this is in pixels let's save and check the result so if i hover over the slider indeed the image wrapper width is changing according to the mouse position now let's leave the image wrapper at this point at around 75 percent and resize the window notice that since the image wrapper width is fixed in pixels its proportion relative to the slider width is changing 
It even ends up taking the entire width for smaller screens. Now, to be honest, that's not a big deal. Even in the case of window resizing, the state resets anyway as soon as the mouse re-enters the slider. If, however, we also wanted to take care of this issue, one way would be by adding an event listener for the window resize event. But I think that this would unnecessarily increase the complexity. So, alternatively, we'll simply set the image wrapper width as a percentage of the slider's width. For this purpose, we'll divide this, which is the image wrapper width in pixels, by the slider width, so we get 1 minus mouse x divided by slider width. This quantity, by the way, the mouse x divided by slider width, will range between 0 at the left edge and 1 at the right edge. Well, actually sometimes almost 1. For example, as we've seen at the right edge, mouse X got up to 767 pixels instead of 768, which was the slider's width, but we are okay with that. And let's multiply this by 100 in order to get the percentage. And this is not in pixels now, it is a percentage. Okay, this should work. Let's save and check the result. Nice. And this time, notice that resizing the window does not affect the proportion of the image wrapper width relative to the slider width. Okay, and although totally unnecessary, I would prefer specifying the rounding. So let's use the two fixed method over this result, the percentage, in order to round to four decimal places, which is accurate enough. Let's save and make sure that it still works. Okay, looks good. Next, let's take care of the handle so that it moves together with the image wrapper. For this purpose, we'll change its left property value on mouse move. I will copy the image wrapper width calculation since it is quite similar, except that this time we are counting from the left, so it is just mouse x divided by slider width and not 1 minus that. This almost works, but if you recall, we also have to subtract half of the handle's width. Here's how we handled it in CSS, using the calc function. Let's do the same. In order to make things a bit more readable, let's store the handle width into a variable and let's do it here. So again, we use the client width property, this time over the handle, in order to get the handle width and we store that into the slider handle width variable. Moving back to our calculation, we want to subtract half of the handle's width and this is in pixels. I think this should work. Let's save and check the result. Very nice. Now the handle is centered and both the handle and the image wrapper are responding to the mouse movement as expected. And if we inspect, Notice the width value for the image wrapper and the left value for the handle changing while the mouse moves over the slider. 
OK. So by this point we already have a basic version of our image comparison slider. Notice that when the mouse enters the slider we get an instant transition of the image wrapper and the handle to the new position. We could set a transition for that. So in our CSS file let's do it first for the image wrapper. Setting transition duration to 0.25 seconds that's 250 milliseconds and transition timing function to is which is the default value anyway and let's use the same transition for the handle. Let's save and check the result. Ok, it kind of works but doesn't run as smoothly as expected. Using a more appropriate timing function could help. So instead of the is function let's use this cubic bezier function which executes the main part of the transition effect in the very early stages of the transition thus responding faster in our case to the mouse movement. And let's use the same timing function for the handle transition. Much better I think. And if we only wanted the transition to be present when the mouse enters the slider and not the entire time while hovering over, we could just add the transition on mouse enter and remove it after 250 milliseconds which is the transition duration. But in any case the slider we are trying to replicate doesn't use transition for this. As you can see on mouse enter transition is happening instantly. I just wanted to show you how you could go about this. Ok, let's remove transition for the handle and image wrapper and proceed. Next step is to implement the exact same functionality as the original image slider. So besides the main functionality which we've already implemented, notice that by clicking at some point over the slider, the handle is locked at that position and the image wrapper of course as well. And to be exact this happens when I release the mouse button so on mouse up, on mouse down the slider unlocks, I am currently pressing the mouse button and on mouse up again it is locked. Finally when the mouse leaves and re-enters the slider we get the default unlocked behavior. I am not pressing any mouse button now. Ok let's implement what we've just described. First of all we'll need a variable holding the current state of the slider so that at any point by accessing it we can tell whether the slider is locked or not. I think is slider locked is a reasonable name for this boolean variable and initially of course slider is not locked so its initial value will be false. Next let's handle the mouse up event over the slider which will cause the slider to be locked. So we are adding an event listener over the slider for the mouse up event and whenever this event occurs the slider mouse up function will be executed. Let's implement this function right now. All we want to do here is to set the is slider locked variable to true. So if currently the slider is not locked or in other words the is slider locked variable is set to false, 
then we set it to true and now that I'm thinking of it the if condition is probably not even necessary since the mouse up event comes after the mouse down which will always unlock this lighter but let's keep it for clarity so on mouse up we set the is slider locked variable to true but how do we actually lock this slider so that the image wrapper and handle won't readjust on mouse move over the slider well all we have to do is to first check before proceeding in the slider mouse move function whether the slider is locked and in this case to stop the execution and exit the function otherwise if the slider is not locked proceed with calculating and readjusting the image wrapper width and handle left values according to the current mouse position the way we've previously described let's save and check the result on mouse move over the slider we get the expected functionality and on mouse up let's do it at this point indeed the slider gets locked but of course now the slider remains locked no matter what we do so as a next step let's take care of the case where the mouse pointer leaves the slider and re-enters in such a case of course the slider should be unlocked for this purpose let's unlock the slider as soon as the mouse exits or leaves the slider so let's also add an event listener over the slider for the mouse leave event and in this case the slider mouse leave function will be executed let's implement this function all we have to do here is to make sure that the is slider locked variable is set to false so if the slider is currently locked or in other words the is slider locked variable is currently true then we set it to false and that should work let's save and check the result so if i lock the slider with the mouse up event at this point now it is locked and leave the slider now it should get unlocked and re-enter indeed okay and finally let's also make it possible to unlock the slider on mouse down for this purpose we add an event listener over the slider this time for the mouse down event and whenever this event occurs the slider mouse down function will be executed let's implement this function similarly to the slider mouse leave function we want to make sure that the is slider locked variable is set to false so that the slider will be unlocked this almost does exactly what we want let me show you so if i lock the slider at some point and hold the mouse button down at some other point let's say here close to the center now i'm holding the mouse button down but although the is slider locked variable is set to false so the slider is unlocked we don't get the expected slider readjustment which happens within the slider mouse move function so we should also call this function of course as soon as i start moving the mouse the slider mouse move function is called and we get the expected behavior so in the slider mouse down function and let's define the event parameter because we'll need it after unlocking the slider we call the slider mouse move function passing the event as an argument so that the mouse position of the event will be accessible let's check the result 
I locked the slider at this point with mouse up and if I hold the mouse button down at some other point, indeed now on mouse down the slider readjusts as expected. Ok, so by now we've replicated the behavior of the original slider, we could easily of course modify the behavior according to our specific needs, for example if we only wanted to unlock the slider on mouse down, then we would initially set the is slider locked variable to true and remove the mouse leave event listener so that the slider will only be unlocked on mouse down and again locked on mouse up. So now by simply hovering over the slider nothing happens since it is locked, pressing the mouse button unlocks the slider and on mouse up again it is locked. And of course leaving the slider and re-entering does not unlock the slider either, this only happens on mouse down. Ok, let's undo the changes and proceed. So by now we've ensured that the slider responds as expected to pointer events, but what about touch events? For example, now I'm holding the mouse button down, trying to mimic the corresponding touch event, but nothing seems to be happening. When I click or tap at some point, the slider seems to respond, but in any case we should also ensure that the slider will respond as expected to touch events as well, thus also extending the functionality to touch screens. And that's quite simple, all we have to do is to add the corresponding event listeners for the touch events, for example the corresponding touch event to mouse move is the touch move event, and each time call the same function called by the corresponding mouse event. So upon a mouse move as well as a touch move event over the slider, the slider mouse move function will be executed. And the word mouse is being used kind of loosely now, it also implies touch. There is however just one small adjustment we should make in this function, and more specifically at this point where mouse x or touch x is calculated, and that's because in the case of a touch event, event.clientx would return undefined. So in that case, and notice the use of the OR operator here, in order to get the x coordinate of the touch event we should rather use event.touches, the touches property returns an array of touch objects, one for each finger that is currently touching the surface, we are interested in the first one with index 0 and we want to get the client x property value. And that's all, we don't need to change anything else. Before checking the result, let's also add the corresponding touch event listener to the mouse down event, that's the touch start event and to the mouse up event, that's the touch end event. Although I think that's not really necessary for touch screens, since the slider will only move while touching the screen, so locking and unlocking the slider may be redundant, but let's keep the same approach. For the mouse leave event we definitely don't need a touch screen equivalent, so let's save and check the result. On touch start and touch move, now I'm pressing the mouse button simulating the touch move event, the slider mouse move function is called and the slider behaves as expected. 
and of course on touch end this lighter stops moving. When reaching the left and the right edges of the slider, we get this error, assignment to constant variable. For lines 17 and 18, let's check it out. Ok, I think at some point I accidentally pressed undo, resetting this variable to const. So let's change it back to let. And now again, touch start, touch move, left edge, no errors, right edge, very nice, and touch end, excellent. The next and final feature to add is the tilt effect on mouse over. As you can see, in the original slider, hovering over it causes the slider to tilt according to the mouse position. Now, this feature is totally non-essential for an image comparison slider. One might even argue that adding this effect could distract the user from the main objective, which is to compare the images. Nevertheless, we will add it and it is up to you to decide whether to use it or not. For the tilt effect, we'll use a library called VanillaTilt.js, which is very easy to use and quite small. The current minified version is less than 10 kilobytes, about 8.5. I won't get into much detail today. In the previous video with the title Tilt Effect on Mouse Over, I'm explaining maybe even in extreme detail how you can use this library and we are also implementing the tilt effect from scratch. Feel free to check it out, I will also include a link to that video in the description. Now the first step is of course to include the vanilla tilt.js library into our project. Let's do it via a CDN and let's search for vanilla tilt. Here it is. And copy this URL for the minified JavaScript file and link it to our document. So in our HTML file, let's place the script here. All that remains now is to define which element or elements of our page will have the tilt effect. In our case, of course, that's the image comparison slider and configure the tilt effect behavior in case we want to change some of the default settings. So I will copy this part, this JavaScript code snippet, which we can use to initialize and configure the tilt effect for the tilting element and paste it into our JavaScript file. The tilting element will be the image comparison slider. And if we ignore the configuration object, then all options or settings will maintain their default values. Let's save and check the default behavior. Very nice, we do get the tilt effect on mouse over, it is that simple. However, the default tilt rotation is a bit intense, so we'll reduce the max tilt rotation value. We'll also slightly increase the entrance and exit transition duration and finally slightly scale up the tilted element. So in the configuration object we set max which represents the max tilt rotation in degrees to 5. I think the default value is 15 degrees. Speed, which represents the entrance and exit transition duration in milliseconds to 800. Default value for speed is 300 milliseconds and scale to 1.02 so that the tilted element will scale up to 102% of the initial size. 
default value for scale is 1. Let's save and check the result. Ok, I like the result. I think it is quite close to the original image comparison slider. So there is no need to expand any further. One issue I came across while checking the project in different browsers is a bug with Firefox. Let me show you what I mean. Not exactly what we expected. As you can see, once we pass a certain point, the entire after image which is contained within the image wrapper shows up. I think that this has to do with the 3D transformation of the tilt effect since as soon as I exit this slider and rotation gets back to zero, we get the expected result. If for example we set max tilt rotation to zero instead of five, so that the slider won't rotate, then we get the expected behavior. Now, it took me a while to come up with a working solution. I definitely didn't want to change the HTML structure for this. I even thought after a few frustrating hours of failure to just check whether the user's browser is Firefox and in that case to simply ignore the tilt effect, which should be the absolute last resort. But thankfully, eventually I ended up with a simple CSS solution which also kind of makes sense to me, which is also important. So it seems that the after image, which is contained within the image wrapper with overflow property set to hidden, is not attached to the same layer as the parent or container element. So in order to ensure that they are on the same layer, we can set the transform property value for the image wrapper to translate Z by 0 pixels. And that's all. Let's save and check the result. Very nice. Everything now seems to work as expected. And actually I think the transform property value doesn't really matter as long as the visual result is not affected since just by setting the transform property should be enough for a new compositing layer to be established. For example, let's try translate X instead of Z. Seems to work fine. Let's try perspective. Again, looks good. I think even the wheel change property set to transform would do the job. Okay. But I think the transform property set to translate Z by zero pixels makes more sense. So let's keep that. And let's make sure that it still works fine with Chrome. Nice. And I think we are done. Before wrapping it up, let's try our slider with different images. Some of them having different aspect ratio as well. For example, this image is vertical, it has portrait orientation and as we mentioned, the height of the slider is actually determined by the first image. So let's set it as the first image and keep the same after image. You can see the difference in the dimensions and I think the height is even limited by the max height we've set to 80% of viewport height. For example, if I zoom out, at around this point we get the actual height. On the other hand, if we reverse the images, 
Now this image will determine the height. And here's the result. Okay, that's all basically. Let's also try two vertical images. And just for fun, one more pair. This one is of horizontal or landscape orientation. All images I'm using, by the way, I got from the Unsplash website. Very nice. Everything starts with a cup of coffee and coffee is converted into code via the programmer, of course. Okay, that's all for today, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and got some value out of it. If you did, please hit the like button and share the video with anyone who might be interested. Don't forget to subscribe if you want more. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. Until next time, keep coding, keep improving and enjoy the journey. Take care. Bye.